Okay, here we are in our second week. Here's a little lecture. And we're going to talk about the, the input-out section in a little more depth. I introduced it last week in the, uh, in the earlier lecture. We're going to look at it in a little more detail here. And this is uh, loosely based on Chapter 2 of the book. So the uh, input out uh, the input output section is where the uh, actual devices are connected. The inputs provide status, and the outputs control things. For example, uh, an input could be something like a switch, a push button, it could be a sensor, limit switch, a float switch. Uh, it, it could be well, an example of a of a discrete, which you might also call digital device, would be a push button that's either on or off. An example of a, an analog input could be a temperature sensor. It changes gradually between values. So it, it can be on a little bit, can be on a lot. When it comes to outputs, <coughs> A, a, a discrete output could be a, an indicator light. The indicator light is either on or off, whereas an analog output could be a, a gauge or a, a meter that reads some value between zero and some maximum. So the inputs provide status information and the outputs actually control things like motors uh, and so forth. Uh, discrete, again, it's uh, it's either on or it's off. Analog, it can be a number of uh, different values between, in some cases, it can be from, from zero to infinity. Uh, fixed or modular, a fixed device is one that uh, the inputs, the outputs, the processor, the power supply, everything is in one enclosure, one unit. Whereas modular has different cards that can be interchanged, moved around. Uh, so for example, if a power supply goes bad here, you can swap it out and replace it with another power supply. Whereas if this power supply goes bad, you would either have to repair or replace the entire device. Same thing with inputs and outputs. The modular design gives you a lot more flexibility. In a, in a wind turbine, a typical PLC configuration, and, and of course it's going to vary depending on turbines, but as an example, the, uh, the standard General Electric 1.5 turbines, similar to what they have in uh, Walnut and other places, will have a uh, PLC located uh, down tower, in other words, at the base of the tower. And then it'll have uh, slave modules in the, in the nacelle at the top and uh, in the hub. Inputs in a, in a uh, wind turbine, the input to the PLC is going to be connected to things like the anemometer. That's the device. Usually it's on the rear of the nacelle outside that indicates the wind speed and the wind vane, which tells you which direction the wind's blowing from. That's pretty important information you want to, in order to have the turbine operate at its uh, peak efficiency, it has to be pointed into the wind and the blades have to be pitched to catch enough wind to uh, generate the electricity needed. Uh, temperature sensors, you need that information to, well, uh, let's say the transmission, for example, you have to make sure that the transmission doesn't uh, overheat. So if it gets to a certain point, uh, you would want to alert the uh, maintenance personnel that there's a problem. Intrusion detection, if, if somebody opens a door, uh, opens a cabinet, the PLC has that information and uh, vibration sensors. Using the transmission again as an example, if if 
if uh, a tooth on a gear uh, gets uh, damaged in some way and it causes excessive vibration when it operates, you need something to uh, shut down the turbine and alert the maintenance personnel. Fluid level, for obvious reasons, you have to you know if your if your fluid levels are getting low. And anything, anything that uh, uh, can provide information to operate the turbine will have a, a, a sensor tied into the PLC. So that information can be gathered and used to operate the PLC. And an example of a uh, uh, <coughs> of a PLC that's actually used in a turbine is uh, made by a company called uh, Bachmann, which I believe is Dutch. And I put a link to their uh, brochure in the uh, in sale under Lessons Web Resources. Yeah, it's a little bit hard to see in this uh, with all this stuff in here. But you can take a look at this when you get a chance. It's uh, it's mainly a marketing thing, so it's a lot of jazzy graphics and other things. But at some point, as we go down here, it goes into some of the details about uh, how they provide the best solution for uh, wind turbine operation. I like these single blade turbines. Those look pretty cool. And here, it's uh, not a real good uh, real good picture, but you can kind of get an idea uh, of what it looks like. It's a modular design with uh, cards that are you know, wired in the back to the different inputs and outputs. As a turbine technician, if you ever had to replace a sensor, you would probably replace the sensor where it's located and if the connection from the sensor back to the uh, back to the PLC is good you you probably wouldn't have to do anything else I can see there's there might be situations where you would have to replace the uh, the whole connection from the uh, from the PLC all the way to the sensor but uh, I would see that as kind of a rare thing We'll talk more in the other class about SCADA, and uh, that has to do with acquiring and analyzing data over time. And here's a uh, so here's a diagram. Here you've got the uh, the PLC up in the up in the hub controlling the pitch. Then you have the PLC in the nacelle, what they're calling the tower box, and then. I'm sorry, that, then down tower would be the, uh, the main unit. And they all communicate. So that's kind of an inter interesting thing for you to take a look at when you, uh, when you get a chance. Uh -huh. Let's talk a little bit about wiring one of these MicroLogics up. So to understand operation and, and to get a handle on how these things are wired up, we'll, we'll look at one of these as an example. This is a MicroLogics 1000 made by Alan Bradley. And we have, uh, I have a manual for that that I placed on the, in the lessons area. If you go to sale, go to web resources. Micrologics 1000 manual. I'm going to open this in a in a new tab. Maybe give myself a little more room. Well, a little bit didn't help too much. Uh, but this gives you an example of what a what a typical equipment manual is like. And I wanted you to take a look at this to 
start to learn your way around these things because if you want to be an effective technician you're going to have to learn to navigate these in some cases they're not uh, not real friendly either uh, this covers a variety of devices the Micrologix 1000 is a family of devices Uh, some of it's universal, some of it applies to all the devices, but it, it uh, describes how to wire it, how to actually connect power to it, and uh, how to program it. So this is uh, 422 pages, which of course I don't expect you to read that, but it does have information about the instructions that we're going to talk about later. For now though, we're concerned with wiring. So what I want to look for is, uh, let's see, installing, wiring your controller. Well, that's pretty easy. So let's see, grounding guidelines, syncing and sourcing currents, wiring recommendations, wiring diagrams. I like diagrams. So we're going to go to, uh, what is that, two, page 2 page 2-7, is that what that says? 2-7. Wiring diagrams. <clears throat> Okay, now the trick is you have to find your device in here. And uh, I'm not sure if it shows on here. I think on the side is where it shows this, and of course that's not in this picture. So let's. Uh, this may be the one here. Seventeen sixty one L sixteen AWA. Yeah, that's it. Okay, so let's see what I should do. Zoom in a little bit. And I'm going to see if I can take a little snapshot here. jump over here. Oh, I think I'll just get rid of this. I think I'll paste this guy in here. See how big I can make it. Yeah, that's not too bad. Okay, so to uh, to wire this up, there's there's two parts to the operation. And we, uh, yeah, we may do this in class if we have enough time. Uh, the first part is you have to connect power to it. And it's powered by, well, it can go anywhere from, uh, let's just say 85 to 204, 264. We use normal 110 volts AC. So L1 goes to the hot and L2 is going to be tied to the neutral. Uh, you would also connect the ground if you were if you were installing it. For what we're doing in the lab, uh, I don't think we need a ground. If we wire these up in the computer lab, I may just do that with uh, power cables. Then you could hook up all three. The L1 will be black, the L2 will be white, and the ground will be normally it's green. Okay, so once you have power and you turn the device on, your power light will come on. Well, at first, when you turn it on, it goes through a self-test. processor runs a little diagnostic, and then uh, the power light will come on. So that's job one. Job two is to connect an input. To connect an input, uh, you can see from the diagram, L1, and here they're showing four switches all connected to these four inputs. These inputs are numbered from 0 through 3. In these devices, 0 counts. We're used to ignoring 0, but input 0 is the first input. So you would hook, in order to connect a switch, you would connect one side of the switch to hot, or L1, the other side of the switch to whichever input you're going to use, and then the common lead, which is going to go back to neutral, uh, is connected here. This is your L2. So now if you close one of these switches, you're going to have a complete path for current to flow through the device. 
what will happen then is the if you use input 0 this light here will come on the light for input 0 so if there is a complete path for current to flow into input 0 you would uh, see the light come on and then when you open the switch when there is not a complete path for current to flow input 0 would go off So that may be that may be a good hour's work right there. So yeah, let's make that our task for this class. We'll uh, we'll connect power and one input to one of these MicroLogix 1000s, and then uh, we'll do that over in the wiring lab and see see how it works out.